Hi guys, Sean Griffin with Kingdom in Context. I want to tell you just real quick, we're going to be doing um, six-week courses that we've made available for you, the viewer. If you're interested to know more about the gospel of the kingdom as taught by Yeshua, not only throughout the gospels, but all throughout the prophets, throughout the, the American Canon 66, and even including the apocryphal books, I've put together a six-week course that ties together all that information. We did this course a few months ago. We had a great turnout, great participation. People really seem to get a lot out of it. Here's a couple of testimonies from that course. I never really thought too much about how the creation model uh, really played a good role, huge role in to understand the gospel like that. And so that was a, that was a key factor. And then understanding it from that perspective um, it helps to understand the Father's love and uh, our, our inheritance um, and how that accumulates into the uh, to the harvest. It's beautiful. I mean, and the way you put it together is just, you did a great job. You know, I probably, I started off watching your um, Honor of Kings videos and they were awesome, man. Looking at uh, Enoch and all these other videos and all, all these other books. And that's kind of what, what I've been interested in really. And I feel like I, I had learned a lot from you just from watching those videos, watching your, um, you know, your, your kingdom portions, the morning cups of context. I probably had seen I felt it felt like I had seen about 50 of your videos already, but um, so I was kind of hesitant. I felt like, well, I think I pretty much know what he's teaching here. There's not really much else to it, but I knew there was. So when I when I signed up for it, the class, um, I really just wanted to build a better foundation, build a really strong foundation. I was I was really surprised and shocked at how much depth and how much more I had to go when we got into the class. That it was just um so much uh there's so much depth to it so much more to the gospel of the kingdom not that it's complicated that it's complex it's just that um uh there was a there's just a lot of little parts and pieces that have to be set on good solid foundation for me it helps to know um the see the big picture first i need to see the 30,000 level 30,000 foot view and then start to zoom in on some of the details. And when you can kind of capture that um, with some of these concepts that you put forth, you know, like the, the uh, prodigal son parable and some of these other parables that Yeshua taught, it really does help paint a picture of what the gospel of the kingdom is. And you start to really see um, a more clear picture of what is the Bible is teaching. Because, you know, in the Hebrew roots, there's a little bit of a slant here. Christianity has a little bit of its own take to it. Um, Judaism has its own take to it. But what did Yeshua say about it all? And so that that's what I think you were able to bring home for me was um, just focusing on what was important and what was truly being talked about. If you want to learn how the creation model is important in the gospel of the kingdom, if you want to learn how much the Father loves us, if you want to know uh, the path to our inheritance and how the harvest, how all the harvest of the souls work, this class is for you. The other course that we're offering is over the Book of Enoch. So six weeks, intensive study, breakdown, dissect the Book of Enoch. We'll find all the parallels that are already built into the American Canon of 66 that lines up with the messages within Enoch. We felt that Enoch was an important book to offer as part of one of these courses because the claim of the book of Enoch itself is that it was written for a distant and remote generation, also for a generation that's keeping the law in the last days. And I don't know what other generation that could be speaking of other than ours. It's a very pertinent book for us to understand. We do some of the deception that's already going down in our society, our culture around the world, and then also give us the hope of what to expect, how the father's going to respond. So that's laid out through the Book of Enoch, and there are a lot of parallels with that message in the American Canon of 66, and I'm going to show that so you can help. I can help you understand just exactly where all those synonymous parallels are and how they fit together at, uh, according to the theological themes. So we're excited to offer those two. We think they'll be super beneficial. The message of the Messiah and then the prophecies for these end times as far as these last days, and it's... Um, these are two important messages that we feel we would want our audience to be very well versed in 
so that you can guys can share the beautiful story and beautiful message of hope to all those around you, your friends and family. The information for the courses is in the links below in the video description. You can also go to our Facebook page, Kingdom in Context, where we're going to post the information there for how, how you can sign up for the course. And yeah, you get each course, there's, there's a video conference every week. So you get to actually talk with me um, in video conference and ask questions about the course material. You can all, we can also, many people just ask questions of all kinds, but we, we try to keep it <laughs> focused on the course material as much as possible. Um, as much as that was relatable, but, um, but I do also answer general questions and answers during that time as well. So uh, it was a really fun, interactive time of fellowship, just digging in and dissecting the word. And, um, we, we had a great time, so we're going to offer it again. And you guys are welcome to go check those out. The classes are going to begin December 15th and it's first comes first serve. I only have so many spots I can facilitate for the for the way the courses go, you know, as far as uh, holding how many per class. So go check it out, inquire. I'll get you all the information. Either message me uh, through at Keenum and Context at Gmail or also through our Facebook Messenger page. Many of you are friends with me on Facebook. You can just message me privately if you like as well. But either way, uh, let me know and I'll send you all the information about the course and uh, we'll see if we can get you in as soon as possible. Welcome to Kingdom in Context. The Creator never intended for us to be confused by His words. He gave us His words of life, and He gave them in context, to be understood and beneficial to our walk with Him. This channel's goal is to bring clarity to some of the misconceptions that have formed over time among believers and taught by others, however innocent and well intended. The scriptures make complete sense when we keep them in context of His coming Kingdom and His coming King, Jesus the Messiah. If you're blessed by what we're doing with this channel and feel led to support us, visit the video description below where we have a PayPal option, a monthly Patreon option, or a traditional P.O. Box address. Thank you, and remember, context creates comprehension. Hello, welcome back to Kingdom Portions here on Kingdom of Context. I'm Sean Griffin here with my lovely wife and co-host. Hey guys, Shabbat Shalom. I'm Lindsay. Shabbat Shalom, sweetie. Shabbat Shalom. It's always a pleasure to um, do these Kingdom Portions with you, and it's like a dream come true, so thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So we're actually going to be jumping into chapters 6 through 10 of Genesis, mm -hmm. and then pairing them up with some things from Enoch and Jubilees, as well as Colossians. Um, the book of Romans, the book of Isaiah. So we've got some really fun, in our opinion, some, some really fun pairings. Um, so we're excited about it. Make sure you stick to the end. And then, of course, any questions you have, make sure you just put them in the comments because that's how it may take us a few days because we're getting a lot, of, uh, a lot more questions and, yeah. e and messages through all platforms these days. So um, it's just part of it. But please be patient with this because we just can't get to them all. And some of them, um, I'll be honest, sometimes if we can't understand them, it's hard to respond. You know what I mean? Yeah. So try to make it, you know, as word, you know, look at what you've written and try to make sure it's worded really well so that we know that you're actually asking a question. Um, that way we can try to respond to you as soon as we can. But also over the past several weeks, we've actually had, actually it's been several months, the past yeah. two months, maybe two, three, so Longer about seven, to eight weeks. <laughs> uh, we've had people come, uh, actually message us, asking us how they can support us because they would like to see us do this full-time because mm -hmm. right now we're not doing it full-time we're just we work full-time jobs and we just do this when we can so um we actually in the comments below is a link to the paypal and patreon if you want to become a patreon member or if you just you don't have patreon access or don't want to do that paypal is a lot easier apparently for a lot of people so you can do that and you can choose how you want to support us just pray about it uh, between you and your family and make sure that's something you want to do and, and of course our goal is to edify you to help you grow in the word so you can understand it coherently explain it to those who love friends family and then those who maybe want to see coming to the kingdom right you're you know people you're trying to get to know the lord um, because you're wanting to explain it to them so we we are trying to give you the tools to be equipped to do that to be edified enough so that you can feel confident in what you're talking about so if if any of our videos, um, whether it's Kingdom Portions or Honor of Kings or the Morning Cup of Context or any of the videos on this channel have blessed you in that regard, um, just prayerfully consider any kind of support that you may have in your heart. Thank you. So, sweetie, this week we have the flood, right? Mm -hmm. It's it, the big event that's happening. We're going to spend a good three chapters, uh, four chapters almost, discussing Noah, 
before and after the flood, how he's, how he's responding to it. And then we're going to pair that off with uh, some of the antagonists, the people that were responsible in, for some of the chaos that led up to the flood, as well as Noah's response um, according to God after the flood. So I'm excited about it. And what do you say we dive right in? Yes. Okay. I'll start. So first place we're going to start reading for those reading along or following along is in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. And this is going to be a lot like last week, guys, where there's truly so many different paths that we could go down uh, with these chapters of Genesis that we're, you know, we, we narrowed it down to just a few subjects to focus on. We also shortened this portion a little bit. The traditional portion would go through chapter 11, but chapter 11 in and of itself has things in it that we would want to spend time on. So we decided to customize this for ourselves a little bit. <laughs> All right. So chapter six. <clears throat> Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they took wives for themselves whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. You shall make the ark with rooms, and shall cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it, the length of the ark 300 cubits, its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and finish it to a cubit from the top, and set the door of the ark in the, in the side of it. You shall, make it with lower, you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Behold, I, even I, am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life, from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish." But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Of the birds after their kind and of the animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of the ground after its kind, two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of all food which is edible and gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him. So he did. So we've got bad guys introduced. Yep. We have the uh, flood announced, basically. Mm -hmm. And then we've got instructions for how to you know, make the boat, bring the animals, which was really important. Um, what I think is interesting, I think it's in verse 18, where he says, uh, I, but I will establish my covenant with you mm -hmm. and your sons. So some people... Um, you know that actual that actual word in the Hebrew, um, it's like a strong concordance. Short definition is to stand up or to arise, right? Um, Which word? The the actual word being used in Genesis six eighteen for the, for establish when he says, oh, okay. "I will establish my covenant with you." So it it makes me think. Um, it makes me wonder because you know we know that uh, Hebrews eleven and and you know pretty much the whole purpose of doing what God has instructed us is that we're doing the terms of the covenant, mm -hmm. which are called his commandments. And then therefore, you know, it, it shows him that we, it's in our heart to obey his commandments. And therefore he, that's how he evaluates whether or not, you know, we're sincere, right? We're respecting his authority and we're actually walking in love with him, right? That's whether or not we find favor. Exactly. That's right. That's, that's the actual biblical definition yeah. of being in the favor of God. So this concept here is that some people would suggest that this was a brand new covenant being established with Noah. Yes, I have saying? heard that. But I would I would pose that it's it's just reaffirmed. This is him establishing 
uh, not to the sense of I'm going to make a brand new one, mm-hmm. but just I am just further solidifying. I'm further standing on the covenant that we was already given to mankind through Adam, right? Right, which is this promise that I'm gonna, you know, you guys get kicked out of the garden because of unrighteousness. Practice these my ways, my behaviors of righteousness, and when I resurrect you, I'll get you back in the garden. Yeah, it's very simple, it really is. So therefore, he's using these key players that are actually faithful to him throughout time, and Noah was definitely one of those. Right. That's why you read in Genesis six eight, and he said, "But Noah found favor of the Lord; he was righteous." In, right. in his generations, right? So how could can I be righteous according to a biblical definition of righteousness if there was no law? Well, that's exactly correct. He wouldn't so, have been walking with God if he wasn't walking in the ways of God. And the right. ways of God are his commandments. So when we talk about, you know, when we say the word God's law, mm-hmm. if, if you can, try to reprogram your brain because there's so much negative connotation with that. Just try to understand all they are is just instructions. Yeah. Just God's instructions for living. Um, sometimes I even playfully tell my, you know, remind myself whenever I see God's law, all it's just saying is God's behavior. Yeah. That's really all it is. It's he's wanting us to emulate his behavior and he gave us detailed instructions on how to do that. You know what I mean? So that's why like in the book of Enoch, you read about the laws of the sun and moon as they complete their circumference right. of their orbits in the, in this, in the firmament above. And it's called the law. It's just basically meaning it's like, you know, it's their circuits, of how things work, right? Just like in, in natural sciences outside of scriptural ideas, like, you know, you've got uh, the laws of physics, mm-hmm. right? Laws of motion, uh, the laws of thermodynamics that people can kind of observe. These are these are not saying like it's a legal law. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's just the concept of like, this is literally how you do this. This is the instructions and this is how this works. Right. So when you go outside of how that works, you don't get the intended result. Well, it also says in Jeremiah 33, I believe, it mentions his covenant with the sun and moon. Yeah. So right. whatever whatever those, you know, lights are, you know, they have a covenant with him as well, whatever that means. <laughs> that's absolutely right. Yeah. So that's so yes, there were legal implications, both civil and judicial <laughs> for instructions in God's law for misbehavior, right? For social conflict between two people or for administering justice as far as if someone had, you know, had committed a, a crime. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, again, just like our legal code today, those are instructions on how to behave in these circumstances. Right. Okay. So this whole concept law just makes people feel like it's, it's like a huge barrier or like a metal bat swinging at their head. And they're always trying to duck it or get out of the way, or they think that they're somehow burdened by this concept. And I'm like, no, it's, he made you as a person living in this creation model, and he told you how to live. This right. is called his law, quote unquote, his instructions for living. Well, what's interesting is that people only get that way when it comes to his law, because most of us, most believers everywhere, would want to be considered law-abiding citizens right. of the United States, yeah. and there's not they're proud of that. I'm a law-abiding citizen, and that's something to say, you know, with some pride. You're yeah, not we, a criminal. We, we like, encourage you to be a law-abiding citizen. Yeah. yeah. So it's just, it's interesting. And to me, coming from the world of being an unbeliever into becoming a believer, I really think it just has to do with our subconscious rejection of the notion of our own responsibility for our sin. Yeah. I didn't like to be told that there was a God somewhere that didn't like my behavior and, and was trying to dictate what was right and what was wrong to me. So, you know, I think that it just, it comes from our, you know, our struggle with sin, really, and not wanting to accept the fact that sin is transgression of his law. That's and right. so, you know. Which is why he would say that the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. Right. Right. Because you're actually getting to a place where you've overcome that negative emotion. Yeah. And you realize, okay, I need some instruction. <laughs> I've seen there's freedom <laughs> yeah. in following his commandments because of the struggle with sin. You know, yeah. it's, it's the only way to come out of sin is to stop transgressing his law. So. That's right. <laughs> to stop transgressing his instructions for living. Yes. That means you're doing instructions for death. Right. For not living, for destructive behavior instead of behavior that produces good things and good results. Yeah. So Noah's called righteous in a generation that was described as wicked. Yes. Okay. All throughout the scriptures, from start to finish, those two definitions of those concepts are only divided by the concept of, are you obeying the God's instructions for living? Right. There's no other definition for that in all the Bible. So, as far back as Noah, and we're going to read about this in later chapters, he was already doing much, like, he explains to us and shows us some of his behavior about how he was considered a righteous man. Mm-hmm. Right? So I think that's amazing. Now, there's some deeper things there. I just want to quick, quickly point out. Because remember, it introduced the Nephilim. 
Yes. Right. So that the the sons of God, okay, the angels, they, they came down. They took wives of whom they chose. They had offspring called these Nephilim. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to explain in later parts of the video, so stick with us. But we're going to talk about the Nephilim. We're going to explain those from Scripture as well as the Book of Enoch, where they what, what they were really you know considered, and as far as what they are today. Yeah. Okay, so where they are today and what their role is, um, because they're still in the mix today. <laughs> it's yeah. crazy. It's crazy. So this is the beginning of the book, right? Remember Genesis mm -hmm. is considered the the word beginning, right? And we're getting all the key players. And the key concepts to consider that going forward through the rest of the book, it's, it all makes sense. So we've got the bad guys introduced to us, both the rebellious sons of God and their offspring that they had like a hybrid mixture between angelic, uh, uh, rebellious angelic men and then human women. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, something that, you know, to keep in your mind. But what's really interesting is to me is when I did a word search on uh, Noah in Genesis 6 verse 8 where it says he was Tamim. Mm -hmm. He was a uh, perfect. Many times it's a generic English, English translation. Yeah. We'll just call it Tamim. Like in this one, um, it says that uh, he was blameless in his time in verse nine. Yeah. But that word in Hebrew used for that is actually the word Tamim. Now, what that means is that he was actually without spot or blemish. And the same word is used all throughout the Old Testament when it's talking about the, the lambs or the goats that they would bring for the sacrifices that were supposed to be without spot or blemish. So the whole point was that he was not just to me, and he, he was already described as righteous in his behavior, right. but now there's an additional definition given to him that he was actually to meme in his personhood, in his biology. So this is what the point of this, of him talking of, of that. Again, the English translation many times, unfortunately, in this passage is very, uh, very generic. It's very well, vague. So I when mean, you look at the actual Hebrew. in his generations, if you take that word gene out, <laughs> yeah. that's what I've yeah. always done. I mean, the whole... The fact yeah, that this, the, the name of the book is Genesis and well, that root word is Unfortunately, gene. people don't, the majority of people don't think along those lines. And other translations also don't, you know, there, there's other vague ways they translate yeah. it. But when you actually look at the Hebrew, what words are being used there, it's amazing, right? <clears throat> because it gives us this quick um, contrast to what we just were reading about in verses 1 through 7, which is this idea of these rebellious sons of God creating these unclean things, these non-tamim things, yeah. these things that were not made of man, but they were not made of angels. They were a mixture, a hybrid that was never intended. So therefore, it's fitting that the people that God would save would be the people that he had he had actually made. Right. You see what I'm saying? And so that's where, uh, but we'll get into some of the more details as we go on. I'm going to start picking up with Genesis chapter 7. And then, um, and remember, I know that there's a lot in Genesis chapter 6 we didn't talk about. Come back next year, guys. Yeah. We, there's just not enough time, there's unfortunately, not, yeah, to discuss. This would be a five-parter. Yeah. Like every single chapter that we're reading, there's like we could spend two, three hours talking about. There's so much in here. But just please be patient with us. So we'll pick up with chapter 7, okay? It says, Then the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone have I seen to be righteous before me in this time. You shall take with you of every clean animals by sevens, a male and his female, and of the animals that are not clean, two, a male and his female. Also the birds of the sky, by seven, male and female, to keep offspring alive on the face of the earth. For after seven more days I will send rain on the earth forty days and forty nights, and I will blot out from the face of the land every living thing which I have made. Noah did according to all that the Lord had commanded him. Now Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of, of water came upon the earth. Then Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him entered the ark because of the water of the flood. Of clean animals and animals that are not clean, and birds and everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God had commanded. It came about after the seven days that waters of the flood came upon the earth, and in the six hundredth year of Noah's life, in the second month on the seventeenth day of the month, on the same day all the foundations of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the sky were opened. The rain fell upon the earth for forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wives and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind and all the cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind and every bird after its kind, all sorts of birds. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos of all flesh in which was the breath of life. Those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, entered as God had commanded him, and the Lord closed it behind him. Then the flood came up on the earth for forty days, and the water increased and lifted up the ark, so that it rose above the earth. The water prevailed and increased greatly upon the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. The water prevailed more and more upon the earth, so that all the high mountains everywhere under the heavens were covered. The water prevailed fifteen cubits higher, and the mountains were covered. 
All flesh that moved on the earth perished, birds and cattle and beasts, and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth, and all mankind. <clears throat> of all that was on the dry land, all in whose nostril was the breath of life, died. Thus he blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the land, from man to animal to creeping things, and to birds of the sky. And they were blotted out... <clears throat> excuse me. And they were blotted out from the earth, and only Noah was left together with those that were with him in the ark. The water prevailed upon the earth one hundred and fifty days. We got unclean animals and clean animals. Well, and before you go any further, I just want to ask you, is there a contradiction here? Oh, there's two that, that people could claim, but you actually just have to remember the context. Well, because we have in chapter 6, he says two by two. That's right. And then in chapter 7, we have pairs se pairs of se seven pairs. Yeah, for, seven the, clean, pairs of for the clean animals, clean. he's the seven clean. pairs. Yeah. Um, and But for the non-clean animals, two pairs. But then even on down here, and in verse uh, 7, that was in verse, uh, what, 2 and 3? But mm -hmm. then in verse 7, um, it says, uh, of, Then Noah and his sons, his wife and his wife's sons, entered the ark because of water the floods, of clean animals and animals that are not clean, and birds, and everything that creeps on the ground, there went into the ark to, to Noah by twos. So I guess if they were couples, they would right. be going in by that's twos. Right. <laughs> that's, that's what it's trying to say. Yeah. Okay. So, so it tells us the amount of coupling yeah. in verses 2 and 3. But then it just reminds us they're, they're going in in couplings. Yeah. Okay? So it's not the amount happening in verse 8 and 9. It's just that they're paired off. It's also another confirmation for the people who like to argue about the LGBT business in the in the animal right. kingdom. <laughs> this is not, right. There were no pairs of, you know, male and right. male going in there or That's anything, right. guys. It's all male and female <laughs> yeah. by the pairs. Yeah. Uh, everyone, all the males and females had a mate. Right? Yeah. Yeah. For what does it even say? What does it even says and... Um, Verse says, verse three to keep offspring yeah, alive, keep offspring alive on the, the face, face of the earth. earth. <laughs> so if a bunch of males paired yeah. off and went in there, there would not be offspring alive on the face of the yeah. earth. But we we won't go too far on the yeah. on the basic it's logic. Just an aside. This. It's funny, <laughs> but this is what some people claim because again, this is why you know we're we're here doing kingdom portions. Um, this is not kingdom in context, and one of the biggest things that we're always trying to remind folks is that you know we have to read the whole passage. Yeah, we have to read the context of things so that we don't get confused because Genesis is one of those infamous books. That will make a statement, but mm -hmm. then it backs up and explains that statement further. Yeah. Okay. That's what we're reading in verse two and three of chapter seven, where it says they went in, male and female, seven pairs of clean animals, two pairs of everything else that was unclean. Then it goes on to say, oh, and by the way, they all went in two by two. Yeah, and that's sweet. That's why I always encourage just looking at the context of everything that we're reading, because if we read the end of chapter six with the first eight to nine chapters of chapter seven, right, we get context. So sometimes the context is in just the immediate surrounding verses. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's an entire chapter. Sometimes it's multiple chapters before it's, yeah. right? Because they've been building up to something because there was an actual concept being explained. And then other times, like we're gonna, we've are gonna, we seen in Genesis a few times already, an idea is thrown out there in summary form, but then later it's backed up and they explain it in depth. And that's just, again, this requires us to be consciously reading the whole thing yeah. and not just parceling out little pieces, you know? And remember that there were no chapter and verse breaks that's right. in the original writings of these. So, you know, our the way our minds, our minds are programmed with a chapter and verses and, you know, very rigid with that, you know, we tend to... We tend to think subconsciously that must mean everything is chronological. Right. Yeah. So. Yes, but it's not. It yeah. just it used, again, we have to look at the context of what's going on. So um, there's a, chapter 7 is interesting. Um, and, of course, you know, I love verse 11 because it says the floodgates of the firmament were open. The flood, again, this translation we're using is a little generic, but we, we chose it because it's the most palpable for the English language. Right. So it's one that doesn't confuse people. There's not a lot of Heblish mixed in, but it's actually, and it's not old style KGV language mixed in. Yeah. It's just, but it actually, the words are almost um, completely synonymous with the KJV, to be honest, as yeah. far as the translation goes, as far as the sentence structuring. Mm -hmm. um, because we do like the KJV a lot as well, but it's just a simpler English reading. And in this particular one, in verse 11, it says the word sky. But as we are already told, it is the heaven with waters above it. That's what we talked about last week, right? Mm -hmm. Genesis 1, verse 6 through 8. There was a structure firmament that was called domed by God in, in Amos chapter 9. And that this structure supports waters above it. And these floodgates of this structure open up during the flood and water comes down in. 
So not only did the, did the earthquake and the fountains of the deep burst forth, right. and we have water coming up from below, but there's also water pouring in from above, which, you know, it makes me wonder, like, the, the rate of water pouring in, right? Yeah. So if you're turning on a faucet into the sky and it's falling down, as you've, we've seen a waterfall, right? Just mm-hmm. from, you know, 70, 80 foot waterfall, the water falling down, not all of it just falls straight down. The, the air friction starts to make it mist out. Mm-hmm. Right, just the, the the molecules, the water droplets themselves missed out, and and then you have, like, if it's a big waterfall in the areas surrounding the waterfall, you can actually have like little mini, you know, mini showers where it's finally falling down. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it feels like it's sprinkling or raining. So to me, that's that's how I'm picturing this flood, the raining part for forty days and forty nights, is that the floodgates of uh, heaven opened up of the firmament, water's pouring down in, but it's at such high altitude. It's dissipating into rain clouds, right, continually, and it just doesn't stop raining, you know. So that's kind of the way, practically, that's the way I see it. I don't know. What about you? Uh, No, I think that's actually probably the most, the best, like, visualization I've ever had of it is what you just explained just now. Oh, well, sweet. And (laughs) just so you know, guys, he was referring to the NASB. Um, Yeah. I know. Yeah. Everybody's favorite question when we first meet each other, aside from what church do you go to, is what Bible translation do you like the yeah, best? It's... We're not, we don't get bogged down too much and focusing heavily on, you know, what the best translation is. We just like what's most palpable for reading out loud. And, and as you already heard in this episode alone, probably last week as well, you know, we actually dig into the Hebrew as well. Yeah. To see what's, what's the, going on. The there. NASB is a perfectly good translation if you're, you know, if you just want a clear reading of the word. It's a relatively literal translation from the Hebrew. And yeah, we do have some of our heliocentric leanings in here where they'll say expanse instead of firmament. You know, if I'm going to quote a verse on Facebook where I want to point out the use right. of the word firmament, I might not use the NASB version. Um, but just in case you were wondering what translation he was referring to we for you guys we read out of the nasb so. yeah and they all all the translations have their flaws yeah and that is by design yeah like that that's the required you know for the requirement for publishers is that you can't have the same book yeah you can't have it's like there there's there's uh requirements that you know copyright you, copyright issues you can't have the same book so even the kjv and, and this uh, guys people don't don't freak out too bad but even the kjv has its own issues yeah so um that's where none there's no perfect translation right. we we actually love um an internet site called biblehub.com yeah. because it gives you all the translations you can compare instantly and then it lets you look in all the concordances and lets you look in the greek and the hebrew and all the lexicons it's a very helpful resource and tool so i mean you guys can look at that at your own time um, anything else in seven you want to talk about? Uh, no, I think we can move on to eight. Oh, and we did want to point out that Noah clearly knew what clean That's right. animals were and unclean animals. He knew. Yes. Okay. Which is a description given to us in God's instructions. Right. Exactly. God's law. Yeah. Okay. All right. Chapter eight. But God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him in the ark. And God caused a wind to pass over the earth and the water subsided. Also, the fountains of the deep and the floodgates of the sky were closed and the rain from the sky was restrained and the water receded steadily from the earth. And at the end of 150 days, the water decreased in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month. The ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. The water decreased steadily until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains became visible. Then it came about at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made, and he sent out a raven, and it flew here and there until the water was dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove from him to see if the water was abated from the face of the land. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot, so she returned to him into the ark, for the water was on the surface of all the earth. Then he put out his hands and his hand and took her and brought her into the ark to himself. So he waited yet another seven days, and again he sent out the dove from the ark. The dove came to him toward evening, and behold, in her beak was a freshly picked olive leaf. So Noah knew that the water was abated from the earth. Then he waited yet another seven days and sent out the dove, but she did not return to him again. Now it came about in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. Then Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the surface of the ground was dried up. In the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth was dry. Then God spoke to Noah, saying, Go out of the ark, you and your wife and your your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out... 
Bring out with you every living thing of all flesh that is with you, birds and animals, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may breed abundantly on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth, went out by their families from the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth and I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and cold and heat and summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. It's beautiful, wonderful, wonderful promise, wonderful Mm -hmm. covenants. And uh, I just love how it talks about the the waters receded, and there was like this long drying out period. Still wasn't dried out. Supposedly it took another few you know hundred years, but as far as the mountaintop itself, but there was a time where that you know the waters receded, and I guess went back into the the opened, you know, mountains of the deep. Yeah. Um, but personally, I think that's just where some of the water went. I think the rest of it is is frozen <laughs> in Antarctica. Oh. Because remember, the Bible doesn't describe a ball. The Bible describes a circle of land with a domed firmament over it. And the the exterior perimeter of that land is what we would call Antarctica if you made a ball out of that, right? So Antarctica is nothing but frozen ice. And in some places, supposedly, it's as much as two miles thick of frozen ice. Yeah. They say if that you melted all the ice in Antarctica that all the cities of the world would be flooded by Hmm. 400 feet. Interesting. So that's covering most of the skyscrapers. Somebody better call Al Gore because right? I'm pretty sure that was supposed to happen like 10 years ago. <laughs> right. So there, there is uh, it's interesting because, you know, <laughs> Al Gore's inconvenient truth was actually fear mongering from yeah. what God already promised would not happen again. Yeah. He said, I've caused the waters to recede. Now, whatever model you you believe, we strongly make a case from Scripture that God told us the model He made for yeah. creation, and then it's covered by a firmament. So, if we all if we just go quote unquote south, and we're always going to go out to the exterior of the circle of the Earth, we're going to run into this frozen landmass, supposedly no matter where the explorers go, mm-hmm. and it's full of ice. So all that ice there, because <clears throat> at some point they say I think it's what this, the the 80th parallel or something like that, where there's not even trees or vegetation, yeah, nothing can like grow. That, yeah. It's just barrenness and it's just all ice. It's just covered in snow and ice. Um, the Father caused the waters to recede from the flood, and they're they're in my opinion they're not ever coming back because He promised. Yeah. With this covenant, as long as you know the earth remains, this is going to be. The summer, winter, you know, he's not gonna, he's not gonna do this again. And of course, with the rainbow, that I'll never flood the earth again. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, in the modern media news, what do they claim? Right? That oh yeah. Asteroids are gonna hit us, <laughs> and the world's gonna be flooded. Right? Or that we're gonna put out too too much CO two carbon emissions, and that your carbon footprint is way too big. Therefore, Antarctica is gonna, gonna melt. Yeah. You know, and Rio de Janeiro is gonna be underwater in twenty years. Guys, that's the enemy ignoring God's promises to us. Yeah. God has a totally different story where he's talking about coming back and healing the earth, right? Their their attack on his promise to not flood the earth again goes all the way back to Babel. I mean, that was the That's right. the one of the reasons they built the tower was... Well, let's, let's not give away next episode. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, that's right. One thing I wanted to mention that I think is neat, uh, and this is just a little in passing, I just think it's interesting that the ark came to rest in the seventh month. Yes. So, you know, I just, I don't think that's a coincidence. No, it's you know, not. And the wording that he chose to use, that the ark rested on the seventh month. Which, which verse are you looking at? It's, um, give me that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> In the seventh month, on the seventeenth day of the month, the ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. That's so right. So I just always thought that, you know, whenever I, I like to do little Sabbath memes. Sure. And so every Sabbath morning, I'll, you know, I'll look up all the verses that talk about the Sabbath. And what's interesting is that verse is always pulled up when you Google Bible verses about the Sabbath. Yeah. It, it pulls up that verse along well, with all the other ones that are clearly talking about the Sabbath. Let me ask you this. What is... Um, when is the start of Sukkot, the Feast of Booths? Oh, don't put me on the spot. <laughs> how many days? Let me. Let me. Here's how many days after the Day of Atonement is it until the Feast of Booths starts. 
oh, 10 days? I, I don't, don't put me on the spot. I don't know. Is it? <laughs> it's only my second year keeping them, babe. Yeah, I get it. It's fine. But what I'm saying is... You answer it's in, it. It's interesting. You know the answer. You answer. That this, the seventh month is a big month, right? Yeah. You got the Feast of Trumpets. Yeah. You got the Day of Atonement. You got the Feast of Sukkot, yeah. which is called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, whichever translation you're using. Um, and here is this same month. All this stuff's happening is when he rests, yeah. right? I think that's fascinating yeah. to me. That's, that's really cool. And in our Jubilees portion coming up, we're actually going to read about how he memorializes these times and these events of when, you know, of, of everything. We'll read it. It's a lot of fun, guys. Yeah, because so, believe it or not, we're still celebrating the things he was celebrating. Oh, yeah. We just don't know it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's... All right, guys. So uh, okay. let's look at um, chapter 9. All right. Chapter 9, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. The fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky. With everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea, into your hand they are given. Every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give it all to you as I have given, as I, as I gave the green plant. Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely I will require your lifeblood. From every beast I will require it. And from every man, from every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he has made man. As for you, be fruitful and multiply. Populate the earth abundantly and multiply in it. Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, Now behold, I myself do establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds and the cattle, the, every beast of the earth is with you. Excuse me, every beast of the earth with you. Of all that comes out of the ark, and it, even every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you, and all flesh shall never again be cut off by the water of the flood. Neither shall there again be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, This is the sign of the covenant which I am making between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all successive generations. I set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow will be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. Never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every life, every living creature of the earth. Excuse me, every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant, which... Try that again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, we got doggos in the room. <laughs> and God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant, which I've established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth, and Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. Then Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself in his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon their brothers and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, so they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah woke up from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Noah lived three hundred and fifty years after the flood. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. <clears throat> so much to go over that chapter, yeah. guys. We're just going to do our best to try to, um, work. like I said, we'll get to the rest next year. Please be patient. Um, 950 years. 950 years, guys. 950 years. I mean, so what does it say about Moses when he died? 120 years old. His mm -hmm. strength was not abated. His eyesight was not dimmed. 950 years <laughs> what 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 kind of arthritis you got in 950 <laughs> years you know what i'm saying what what um i don't even know man does he still have his teeth does he have like perpetual halitosis like what's <laughs> happening with noah 950 can you is his brow grown into his cheekbones where he's just looking through slits at you you know hanging on his staff like i have no clue what a 900 year old man looks like but we will right because what is the promise in Zechariah 8. Oh, yeah. We will right? see people live to that age. When he comes back and when the kingdom returns, we're actually going to see the survivors of the day of the Lord who lived, who are outside the city, who can get their food, water, and medicines from the city. And, and if they're doing God's instructions for living, they can actually come inside the city to a degree. It says they'll be old, living as long as trees and as long as the forefathers used to live. So we'll get to see a 900-year-old man, right? Maybe... One of us will be tasked to go trim his eyebrows. 
because they're just getting out of hand. You know what I mean? So all I'm saying is, is that, um, I mean, I'm, well, I imagine if you've got, you know, I imagine they'll be well-groomed if they've got the river of life to drink from and the trees, of the, yeah. you know, so they'll yeah. probably have the strength to groom themselves properly. But the point is, I'm just saying that's a, that's something that most of us cannot even fathom mm-hmm. is living beyond a hundred, yeah. usually much less 500 years old or 700 <clears throat> years old. But imagine the kind of conversations, right? You could have with an 800 year old man. We're going to get there. We're going to have it. We're going to be eternal. Those who are in the resurrection. Yeah. Um, and that's what we're shooting for. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. for, blessed is he who takes part in the first resurrection, right? So that's what we're shooting for. But for those who are alive after the day of the Lord and they, and they were not uh, respective of the father and they didn't take part in the first resurrection and they didn't follow his ways or no, you know, uh, confess Yeshua as Lord and savior. So this whole concept, they're actually going to be uh, shown mercy and compassion by the father through his Messiah. And they'll actually be kept alive and we'll be able to teach them the ways of the kingdom, which is called Torah, uh, God's instructions for living. And they're going to be able to, to live extremely long lifespans. It's going to be amazing because disease will be taken care of right you know what i mean they literally got the leaves growing along the trees of life along the river of life inside the city it says we're going to use those for medicines for the nations so i just imagine that they're going to you know imagine look on their face you know when because that generation will have come through the, the mindset we live in today yeah you know where whereas they'll be like well i'm 75 I, you know i'm getting pretty old you know yeah and we're like no you're not because remember what isaiah 11 says if someone dies at 100 it's considered a youth right you know what I'm saying? So we're just be like, man, you haven't even reached 100 yet, man. You're still a baby. You're still like, you know, 15, 10% of your lifespan. So be encouraged, you know. And here, here's some medicine from the from the garden of the city of truth, the New Jerusalem. And uh, and be excited and, you know, get your, this will help your ligaments so you can run faster. You know what I'm saying? Or whatever. The point is, I'm excited about it because here we have at the beginning of the book, all these long lifespans. Mm-hmm. Same thing at the end of the book. It comes full circle, guys. That's why I tells said... Tells the end from the beginning. Tells the end from the beginning. The Father's just trying to get us back to the garden. He's trying to get us back to these circumstances to where people walked in his ways, lived long lives, were promised eternal life. So it's this is the whole purpose of him giving his, us his instructions to follow and learn. So it makes me excited. I know we're not even talking about chapter 9 right now. I'm just I'm on a tangent. I'm sorry. So, well, there was something I wanted to point out in chapter 9 since I know a lot of other... Um, Groups will be reading this, and this topic often comes up with this chapter, and the speculation comes along with it, and that is Noah in his tent with Ham seeing him uncovered. Now, there's a lot of perverse... There's one perverse theory about what that means, but if you just read it, it says Noah uncovered himself and went to sleep in the tent. The the law, that the commandment we have about uh, a son sleeping with his father's wife is the son uncovering his father's skirt, as it's put. Right. This, we clearly have it stated, Noah uncovered himself. And then we have the added part of the story where the other two sons bring him a covering and literally walk in there backwards so they don't see his nakedness. So... I just really want to encourage people not to get lost down that rabbit trail of Ham sleeping with his mother because it's that's not anywhere in the text. Right. And even the even these people interpreting the verse of you know seeing his nakedness, they're not even inter- they're not even using the right, that's right yeah. wording from the actual commandment. Right, they're using <laughs> they're using the actual commandment from was it Leviticus out of uh, out of context. Right. So that's not it's not the scenario that's happening here. Um, what it and Canaan was not <laughs> was not a result yeah. <laughs> of Ham uh, doing something bad with his mother. Actually, if we we're going to read in the Book of Jubilees about this particular part yeah. here in our parents and our portions here in a few minutes, so you know keep <coughs> uh, keep watching, guys. But at, but Canaan was already alive, right? He was an Noah's, adult. Yeah, when Noah's cursing him at this point, and there's a reason. No, we're not actually, actually we don't get into that this week. We actually covered that several yeah. weeks ago of why Canaan was cursed because Jubilees literally tells us like with tons of explanation. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it's in chapter nine of Jubilees, like tons of explanation. And it's in the entire reason, the whole geographical area of the land of Canaan is called the land of Canaan. Yeah. And so it all has to do with this moment here. Um, I can't remember which video that is, to be honest with you. But it's, it's, it's one actually, of our portions. It is one of our portions. It's actually in the title. I believe, of one of our portions, if I'm not mistaken. We'll figure so, it out after we film this, yeah. and we'll put a link in the comments for you guys. <laughs> yeah. So, but, yeah, that's it's just important for people to understand that, um, 
they're to me it's just showing that Ham didn't have the respect for his father. Right. And which is why we see his lineage go off to do the Tower of Babel. Yeah. Right. Which rebelled against God. You know, so this whole thing is Noah is the priest of his family. And many people would say like a high priest, a Melchizedek mm-hmm. priest, which means he's a ruler of all the peoples plus a priest for them. Right. Um, and so he's basically severely disrespecting the authority structure that God had set up for them. Yeah. And this this little story, in my opinion, really helps us when we understand how God uses the priesthoods among the people, because then you understand why this is such a big moment of disrespect yeah. and why Japheth and, and Shem would not look and would like walk in. Yeah. It sounds like Ham up. came out like, you know, yeah. joking about it or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's, there, it's a huge sign of disrespect to the authority structure that's set up. And that's, I mean, we see in number 16, what happens when the authority structure that God set up is challenged. We see that with Korah's rebellion, you know, it never works out well. So anyway, um, chapter 10 is part of the genealogies. There's, bear with this, guys. We want to run through this. And next year, we're actually going to dig into this a whole lot. But it's a little uh, litigious. So if, uh, do you want me to read it or would you like to? You, you want me to go read right it? Okay. ahead. <laughs> That's after right. you made me read that chapter in Deuteronomy. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Your turn. Okay, baby. So in chapter 10, verse 1, it says, uh, Now these are the records of the generations of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and the sons of were and the sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer and Magog and Madai and Javan and Tubal and Meshach and Tiras. The sons of Gomer were Ashkenaz and Repha and Togorma. <laughs> this, okay, verse three says the sons of Gomer were. I uh, just read that. Verse four says the sons of Javan were Elasha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. For these, the coastal lands of the nations were separated into their lands. Everyone according to his language, according to their families, into their nations. The sons of Ham were Cush and Mitzrayim and Put and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba and Havilah and Sabta and Ramah and Sabtika. And the sons of Ramah were Sheba and Dedan. Now Cush became the father of Nimrod. He became a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Eric and Akkad and Kana in the land of Shinar. From that land he went forth into Assyria and built Nineveh, Rehoboth, Ur, and Kala, and Rezin between Nineveh and Kala, that is the great city. Mitzrayim became the father of Ludim, Anamim, and Lahabim, and Naphtuhim, and Patrasim, and Kalshim, from which came the Philistines and the Kaphtarim. Canaan became the father of Sidon, his firstborn, and Het, and the Jebusite, and the Amorite, and the Girgashite, and the Hivite, and the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvadite, and the Samarite, and the Hamathite, and afterward the families of the Canaanites were spread abroad. The territory of the Canaanite extended from Sidon as, as you go toward Gerar, as far as the Gaza, as you go toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboim, as far as Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, by their nations. Also to Shem, the father of all the children of Eber, and the older brother of Japheth, children were born. The sons of Shem are Elam, and Asher, and Afrashad, and Lud, and Aram, and the sons of Aram were Uz and Hul and Gether and Mash. Ar- Arphaxad became the father of Selah, and Selah became the father of Eber. Two sons were born to Eber. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. And Joktan became the father of Almadad, and Shalef, and Hazarmaveth, and Jarah, and Hadaram, and Uzal, and Diklah, and Obal, and Abimiel, and Sheba, and Ophir, and Havilah, and Jobab. All these were the sons of Joktan. Now their settlement extended from Mesha as you go toward Sefer, the hill country of the east. These are the sons of Shem, according to their families, according to their languages, by their lands, according to their nations. These are the families of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, by their nations. And out of these, the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. Okay. Praise you, Father, for letting me get through that. (laughs) This whole chapter is an example of what we were talking about earlier, where it introduces something in summary, and then it backs up and explains it. Yeah. Okay? We get all the different sons listed out, <coughs> and then their sons and grandsons and whatever, right? The territories that, well, we didn't actually, Jubilees actually tells us where they were given the territories. Right. This just tells us they were given territories in different lands and tells you their descendants' names. But chapter 11, which we're not reading today, we're going right. to take care of next week backs up and starts jumping into the story 
of the descendants of Ham. Yeah, we have it saying right at the beginning of chapter 10 that they were divided by their languages. That's right. And the languages haven't been divided yet until chapter 11. Exactly. So this is this is what we're talking about, guys, about reading the full context of something to understand. Genesis does not move chronologically every single time. Right. You just have to keep reading and try to, you know, compare the, the, idea, the thematic ideas or the big conceptual ideas. So the whole chapter is uh, wonderful as far as it's, you know, listing off who's who belongs to who and... Um, you know, we got the introduction of Nimrod, which is kind of a big deal. If you don't know who Nimrod is, check out my video. I'll put um, the flash up here on the screen, and then I'll put the link in the below. It's just a Polyon is the name of the video that I put out uh, a couple months back. And uh, it's been well received so far, but I basically just trace throughout Genesis all the way to Revelation Nimrod's role and, uh, and what his role will be in the future. So go check that one out if you have time. But ultimately, sweetie... Um, we're going to spend more time on this concept and breaking this down in our in next year's portion because yeah. we're, we're already at about 15 minutes in this video and we'd really like to get to these pairings because yeah. there's some some big concepts within the last three chapters we went over that we want people to, to be aware of. So, all right. So now with our first pairing that we're going to read from, we're actually going to uh, address num uh, Genesis 6 verses 1 through 4 where it introduced the Nephilim. Okay, because the Nephilim were a uh, pretty big component piece. In the Old Testament, and um, and still today, by yeah. the way, <laughs> still today. So let's look here in Numbers fourteen, or excuse me, Numbers thirteen, and we're looking at verse thirty-three, <clears throat> and it says, "This was remember the the backstory was the spies were sent into the land of Canaan yes. to look at it and see what's going on. T they come back, the twelve of them, ten of the twelve had a bad report, saying that it wasn't what God described, and that they were afraid from the the inhabitants of the land were big." But Joshua and Caleb were like the only two out of the 12 that believed that they could do it, right? So they, they had the good report and had faith. Um, but in verse 33, it says, There also we saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim, and we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So the word Nephilim itself, the Septuagint, actually translated that into what I think was from the, the Latin Vulgate from the word gigantes. Mm -hmm. So it's actually where we get the English word giant, right? And this concept was that it, um, they were big. That yeah. was the idea. The Nephilim were originally described to be huge. The Book of Enoch described them as massive, huge uh, giants, right? Which would make sense from every other thing that is described in the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees and Jasher about exactly what possibly was going down, how you make a Nephilim. And there's more than one way to make a Nephilim is what I would say. So actually, we um, again, this video is not for that. There's a lot there. But if you want an immediate explanation, I would say go to episode two of Honor of Kings, um, or I think it's episode two or three, both two and three. But um, we basically go over that from the Book of Enoch in depth with science and all kinds of other, you know, from biology and, ge and genetics. And we actually look at different concepts. So um, I'll flash that up here on the screen and put the link in the description so you can check that out later. But this whole concept is the Nephilim were predominantly tall and they're being described by the spies here to be, you know, like feeling like grasshoppers next mm -hmm. to them. So truly, were they that small? I don't know. But, you know, if they were 20 feet tall, you would feel small next to them, yeah. standing next to them. You know what I'm saying? So um, so that's just the idea that this is in the book of Numbers. So this is obviously after the flood. So the big contention is, how do you have, I thought all the Nephilim were destroyed and, and only Noah and the seven family members with him were saved, eight and all, right? How are these Nephilim still around? Well, it says right here in Numbers 14 that they were sons of Anak. Mm -hmm. Okay? Um, so that's actually someone we get from the Table of Nations, a descendant of one of the people listed in Genesis 10. Mm -hmm. So it tells you right there they came about after the flood from one of the people that were born after the flood. Okay? They were their descendants, and they didn't come about by them, but they were the descendants of. So this is actually where we have, we don't have time to go into it again. Yeah. We don't have time to go into it. But in Jubilees chapter 8, there's actually a dude named Canaan, or Kenan, and he actually finds on a dried out rock, because remember that the waters of the flood were still receding everywhere, still drying out in some places. But he finds the teachings of the watchers after the flood and starts doing them. And he doesn't want to tell Noah that he's doing them because he knows Noah will be mad. And so, <laughs> which I think is funny. So point is, the, the rebellious sons of God that came down before the flood and started teaching mankind how to destroy themselves, we get that in the book of Enoch chapter 6 and 7 pretty heavily. Um, their offspring, their sons, were also taught this knowledge that was very destructive. And then they were teaching it to mankind in general. Yeah. Okay, So God didn't want mankind to know how to, to manipulate themselves into Nephilim. 
we're actually going to read about that when we get to our extra biblical bearing, pairings about the motivation of why they would try to become Nephilim or what the Nephilim thought they could accomplish by, you know, by their existence, if you will. And God addresses that himself. So, um, but basically after the flood, some dude who was a, a cousin of Nimrod along that generational line, he finds the teachings of the watchers right on a rock and he starts trying to practice them again. And then suddenly poof, he had all this, this occult practices again, worshiping of idols, sacrificing humans, warfare, they start building the Tower of Babel, right? They want to actually put, make war with God himself. Yeah. Like, it's just, it's craziness. And and I feel bad for Noah, to be honest with you, because the dude just went through a lot to get us a clean slate. And then like 150, 200 years after the yeah. flood, these guys are picking up the same destructive practices again, you know, even to the point where they're making Nephilim again. Yeah. And you're just like, dude, <laughs> it's like, I did that, you know, did we not learn anything? But if you think about it, they're so far removed from the flood. Yes, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah, and then the wives, they had a first-hand account. But everyone else, they're just taking their word for yeah. it, right? And this is the problem of generationally passing on, of why we're instructed to teach children the way they should go when they're young, so when they grow up, they won't depart from it. Because the enemy wants to get into that confusion. Yeah. He wants to get into that, that passing on of information to confuse the next generation, so they don't have a clue what's happening. And then you can tell them a different story, and then you put them at odds with their family to say, well, how do you know your family's telling you the truth? Right. How do you know your family's right? right? You know, maybe they're just making it up to scare you. Maybe they're just trying to keep you from something, right? <laughs> Which is exactly what Satan told Eve in the garden, right? Yeah. He doesn't, you're not going to die. He just doesn't want you to be like him and know what he knows, you know? He's keeping you from that knowledge. So it's just, it's crazy, but that's how easy it happens. And so that's why we see it happening immediately the moment that they have a chance with enough generations passing after the flood. But um, did you have something, you feel like you had something you wanted to say? No, I think you covered everything. No? Okay. okay. I, just, <laughs> I would like to note that Egypt uh, comes from Mitzrayim. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of the um, H- Hebrew roots uh, versions of Bibles, you know, you'll see Egypt just called Mitzrayim. So, you know, if we look at the culture of Egypt, if we look at some of the hieroglyphs on their walls, some of the creatures they were depicting, if we look at some of their kings and queens with their, you know, big, huge weird heads, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, and also there's actually a really cool study online. Um, I don't remember the name of it right now, but someone who went into all of the names of all of the Egyptian gods, the etymology of those names, um, the, the God Hermes, that name Hermes actually means son of ham. Hmm. So, and, and actually all the, the names of the Egyptian gods go back to the biblical patriarchs who survived the flood. So for me, that's just proof right there, you yeah. know, that the flood story is true. And then the, the names of these people were actually, are, you know, are intact. And we can find those names in the etymology of Egyptian gods. So it's just, it's interesting that, you know, Ham's line seems to be the one that went in this route of the occult. And then we have, you know, this culture of Egypt, you know, one of their main gods is Hermes Mm -hmm. and that's, you know, son of Ham. So I just found that to be a really interesting study. And, you know, with all of the the Nephilim talk, you know, when we look at, you know, Egyptian gods who have, you know, a bird head and a human body and things like that, and that might not be just complete myth. I mean, I think they were actually depicting real history. <laughs> it's very possible, especially because in the video that I already put on the screen, the Apollyon video, yeah, uh, I traced back through ancient Egypt to go and find how Nimrod was actually Osiris mm-hmm. in ancient Egypt. Yeah, the big god that they worshipped, Osiris. You know, and he was under the authority of Ra, who would actually be considered the Satan character right. in the Bible, and that's what he was. Anyway, so go check that video out as well because it, we do dig into to our. Both of us, you know, we love history and we try to sort through what secular history tells us compared to what God's truthful history tells us, you know, to try to find links, comparisons that uh, make sense with his word and not just believe the narrative. Because honestly, Egyptologists themselves don't even agree. Oh, yeah. They're all over the board. Egyptian history is what all of the rest of the timeline of history is based on. And the Egyptian timeline is not something that is 
agreed upon. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> they don't even agree with themselves. It's just nonsense. There's a so. great, I just want to give this documentary a plug real quick. There's a great documentary. It was, it's been featured on a lot of the ministries on YouTube and stuff. And it's called Patterns, Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus. And I'm telling you, if you have any friends that are secular who, I have a lot of friends who their main contention is there's absolutely no proof of the Exodus. There's no archaeological proof of that. Show them that documentary, my friends, and see if they come out clinging on to that same opinion because, you know, that it's just really well done. It basically shows the right timeline for things. And it, and then when you get into the right timeline, you do find the archaeological evidence. Hey, isn't that the is that the first documentary we watched on our first date? <laughs> it is. <laughs> I wanted to show him a documentary on our first date, and that was the documentary yes. I showed him. Yeah, I think we, we watched that on our first date. So. Yes. <laughs> it is anyway, good. I, it's really it good. good. It's really well done. Yes, <laughs> yeah, you should go check it out. Um, so uh, apparently it's so good because I remember it. Yeah. <laughs> right? So it was definitely, yeah. Either way, guys, um, yeah, check out the documentary. But let you know, just jumping in, we're not going to spend too much time on 10 like we talked about. Uh, but we did want to address just the concept <laughs> Nephilim were after the flood. And we're going to go into Jubilees and, and Enoch real quick because they're actually going to tell us why we still deal with them today yeah. and how, what that means. But also, real quick, remember when it said Genesis, uh, Noah was considered righteous? Yes. In verse 8 of Genesis 6. Well, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, the Father tells us a definition of righteousness. Imagine that. Imagine that. So unless he suddenly has two different definitions of righteousness... He's consistent with his word, and he actually defines the term he used to call Noah righteous mm -hmm. in chapter 6 of Deuteronomy, verse 20, 25. It says, It will be righteousness for us if we careful if we are careful to observe all this commandment before the Lord our God, just as he has commanded us. So this is a summation of what God had just finished repeating the Ten Commandments and all the, right. all the instructions. Now, all of Deuteronomy is full of instructions for living for different scenarios, different things. But all of them are called mitzvah instructions commandments ordinances precepts these concepts just like genesis 26 5 abraham is commended for obeying god's god's commandments this is what is considered righteousness and this is how we exemplify our faith we believe he exists we believe he sent his son to be our messiah and he fulfilled his purpose and he now is our high priest ministering before the father on our behalf to create atonement for us to give us eternal life on the day of the lord and the first resurrection and how we exemplify belief in him, to walk in his ways, to abide in him, is his commandments. Yeah. Right? And that's what is called righteousness. Noah himself was abiding in the Father, and it was considered righteousness for him. There's actually a place in Jubilee 7, sweetie. We're not going to get to it tonight. But in Jubilee 7, there was a place uh, where it talks, if, if people want to read on their own, uh, where Noah is teaching his sons and his grandsons to love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. It's been the same law since the beginning, God. Yeah. It's just, guys, it's just, it's everywhere. It's pervasive. This is why we talked about last week, Cain and Abel were bringing sacrifices, both yeah. animals and fruits of the ground, because it was all a part of God's instructions. Okay. Um, so real quick, let's jump over to, um, let's go into Enoch chapter 10. And in Enoch chapter 10, we're going to be reading from verses uh, 4 through 15. And this is a lot of fun, guys. <laughs> Because we're actually going to get, um, this is this is what's going on before the flood, right? So remember, Enoch was the great-great-grandfather of Noah, and he was the one that, um, according to many, many part past, okay, well, that's a little controversial. We won't go into that tonight. Uh, we, won't, we won't talk about his death and where he is. And Jubilees actually yeah. tells us about his death um, and why he was taken back into the garden for a reason. And there's, there's a lot more to it that's not given in the American canon of 66. Um, so there's, and I know guys, Hebrews 11, five, I know, please don't fill the comments with the, <laughs> with the fact that it says it did not see death. There's context to that. And that context is given to us both in Genesis and also in Jubilees and great, great plethora of amounts. So, uh, Enoch is waiting for the first resurrection like everybody mm -hmm. else. Okay. He is not, he, Jesus was the first fruit. So the first yeah. resurrection, he's the first one to get this new spiritual body. We then follow after him. Enoch did not proceed Jesus in getting that. So he's waiting for the first resurrection too, just as Hebrews 11, 39 through 40 tells us. So real quick, the setting, Enoch chapter 10. The angels have sinned. They've created babies with women. Bad deal. God's going to punish them. He's, he basically, this is him telling the punishment of both the rebellious angels and also the, the offspring, the Nephilim. 
Okay, verse 4, it says, And again the Lord said to Raphael, Bind Azazel hand and foot, and cast him into the darkness, and make an opening in the desert which is in Duduel, and cast him therein, and place upon him rough and jagged rocks, and cover him with darkness, and let him abide there forever. And he cover his face that he may not see light. And on the day of the great judgment he shall be cast into the fire, and he, and heal the earth which the angels have corrupted. And proclaim the healing of the earth, that they may heal the plague, and all the children of men may not perish through all the secret things that the watchers have disclosed and have taught their sons. And the whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel. To him ascribe all sin. And to Gabriel, said the Lord, proceed against the bastards and reprobates, and against the children of fornication, and destroy the children of the watchers from among men. Send them one against another, that they may destroy each other in battle. For length of days they shall not have, and no request that they make of thee... Uh, shall be granted unto their fathers on their behalf, for they hope to live an eternal life, and that each one of them will live, but each one of them will live 500 years. And the Lord said to Michael, Go bind Simyaza and his associates who have united themselves with women, um, so as to have defiled themselves with them in their clean, uncleanness. And when the sons have slain one another, they have seen the destruction of their beloved ones, bind them fast for so many generations in the valleys of the earth till the day of judgment of their consummation till the judgment that is forever and ever is consummated. And in those days they shall be let off the abyss of fire to the torment and the prison which they shall be confined forever. And whosoever shall be condemned and destroyed will from thenceforth be bound together with them to the end of all generations. Okay. So this idea is we have, um, we have the the, nep- the offspring, the watchers, right? They were, mm-hmm. they were trying to, like it said, they were trying to live forever. They right. want to live an immortal life. So this is the point of them being spiritual beings. So we've talked about this in many videos, okay? Is this idea of uh, understanding what Paul... Paul gives us a great explanation about it, actually, in 1 Corinthians 15, where he's breaking down the difference between us as we're born of Adam, right? We're all descendants of Adam, and Adam was made from the dirt, from the earth. He calls us earthy in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 35 through 49. But those who are born of water and spirit, right? We're born of earth and spirit. Right? The Spirit of God breathed onto Adam. He became a living soul. We're, but at the resurrection, we'll be made of water and spirit. Right, So it's a different physics, if yeah. you will. Okay, These are how the angels are made. They're made of a different physics. That's how they can interact differently. Mm-hmm. Okay, Their sons, their offspring, these hybrids, they were, they're called spirits. They're not called men. Right. Right. So this is very interesting that they're they're considered spiritual beings. You know, I mean, this these particular ones. Okay, the ones after the flood are a little different. Yeah. Those are and this again, if if the word Nephilim is just talking about giants. Right. That's just a height concept. Right. So you can still have a a very tall dude that you genetically manufacture after the flood, and he can still be Nephilim. Doesn't mean he's a spiritual being. Okay. So there's kind of a difference there. So this um, this whole concept of the pre-flood Nephilim. They were from the offsprings of the of the actual angels, the watchers. Um, they're considered spiritual beings. Okay, so let's just keep reading in another one of our pairings in Jubilees chapter ten because it's going to explain what happens to these guys. Right. So here in Jubilees chapter ten, and we'll read uh, verses one through thirteen. It says, "In the third week of this jubilee, the unclean demons began to lead astray the children of the sons of Noah, and to make to error, and to make to error and destroy them." And the sons of Noah came to Noah their father, and they told him concerning the demons which were leading astray and blinding and slaying his sons' sons. And he prayed before the Lord his God and said, God, God of the spirits of all flesh, who has shown mercy unto me and has saved me and my sons from the waters of the flood and has not caused me to perish as you did the sons of perdition. For your grace has been great towards me and great has been your mercy toward my soul. Let your grace be lift up upon my sons, and let not wicked spirits rule over them, lest they should be destroyed them from, lest they should destroy them from the earth. But do you, but do thou, excuse me, but do thou bless me and my sons, that we may increase and multiply and replenish the earth. And you know how your watchers, the father of these spirits, acted in my day. And as for these spirits which are living, imprison them, and hold them fast in the place of condemnation. And let them not bring destruction on the sons of your servant, my God, for these are malignant and created in order to destroy. And let them not rule over the spirits of the living. For you alone can exercise dominion over them, and let them not have power of the sons of right of the righteous from henceforth and forevermore. And the Lord God bade us to tell to bind all of them. The chief of the spirits, Mastima, came and said, Lord, Creator, let some of them remain before me, and let them hearken to my voice, and do all that I say unto them. For if some of them are not left to me, 
I shall not be able to execute the power of my will on the sons of men. For these are for corruption and leading astray before my judgment. For great is the wickedness of the sons of men. And one of us he commanded, one of us being the angels, and one of us he commanded that we should go teach Noah. Uh, excuse me, I missed a part here. Um, and he said to us, let the tenth part be, uh, excuse me, let me back up here. Verse 9. And he said, let the tenth part of them remain before him, but let nine parts descend into the place of condemnation. And one of us he commanded that we should teach Noah all their medicines, for he knew that we would not walk in uprightness nor strive in righteousness. And we did all, uh, excuse me, I apologize, guys. Uh, the, the text I have on the screen is, is kind of small. I'm trying to enlarge it here. But um, <clears throat> verse 10, and one of us he commanded that we should teach Noah all their medicines, for he knew that they would not walk in uprightness, not strive in righteousness. They being humans, mankind, okay? And we, the angels who are speaking, we did according to all his words. All the malignant evil ones were bound in the place of condemnation, and a tenth part of them we left that they might be subject before Satan on the earth. And we explained to Noah all the medicines of these diseases, together with their seductions, how he might heal them with the herbs of the earth. And Noah wrote down all things in a book as we instructed him concerning every kind of medicine. Thus the evil spirits were precluded from hurting the sons of Noah. And he gave all that he had and written to Shem, his eldest son, for he loved him exceedingly above all his sons. Okay. So these unclean spirits were still on the earth after the flood. Yeah. They lost their bodies. These were the Nephilim. They lost their bodies. But their spirits were not normal. Okay, so they were not like the spirit of a man that immediately goes to Sheol to await judgment or the resurrection. Their bodies went down to, or didn't go anywhere, and they were just still on the earth messing with mankind. Yeah. Right? And then what, they're, what are they doing? They're attempting, oppressing, attacking, trying to destroy, causing havoc and problems, right? Leading astray. Um, and then Noah prays, and nine-tenths of them are sent into Sheol, into the earth, to, to await judgment. But one-tenth of them was left subject before Satan so that, that he could actually use them. And this is what we see when Jesus is walking around, right? Mm -hmm. We see all these unclean spirits. That's how the very first uh, verse of chapter 10 of Jubilee started out. The third week of this Jubilee, the unclean spirits began to lead astray the sons of Noah. So right here, just in case you ever wondered, as you're reading the Gospels, or you hear like a preacher talk about unclean spirits, and you ever wonder like, where did they come from? You know, Jubilee's chapter 10 tells you. They're the, the bodiless spirits of the Nephilim that came about from before the flood. And they were just constantly causing problems. So thankfully, there will be a day at the return of the Lord when he gets rid of them forever. Yeah. I'm excited about that. Because that's... Because, so basically, Genesis chapter 6 introduces us to something that we're still dealing with today. Mm -hmm. So we think we're, we're far removed from the flood. We don't really... You know, it, we see evidences of the flood. But like I was talking about earlier, everyone who had witnessed it is already dead. We can't get a first-hand account. But these unclean spirits, they're still around. These things are ancient, right? And they're still hanging out, <coughs> trying to cause problems in mankind, yeah. trying to get us to do works of lawlessness, to get us to do destruction. So I just think, uh, thank you, Father, for giving us Genesis to explain these things to us so that we understand, you know, this is where the bad guys come from, basically, right? So I just think that's interesting. So this is how, when you have, like, mediums and spiritists and... People that try to claim that they can speak to your dead relatives. How would those spirits know all that information about your relative? Well, they've been around all this time. That's right. They've been around since even before the flood. Yeah. That's why they're called familiar spirits, right? They're literally familiar with your life. They've yeah. been around this whole time yeah. and your ancestors' lives. And I mean, they just had enough. They can easily fool you with information because they've witnessed it. They've been. They're not dying. You know, they're just they're trying to attack and oppress and uh, possess you if possible. You know, so we got to keep walking in the ways of the Father so that doesn't happen. Um, so next we just want to go to uh, Jubilees 5 real quick. Jubilees chapter 5, verse 2 through 4. And the lawless increased on the earth, and all flesh corrupted its way. Alike men and cattle and beasts and birds and everything that walks on the earth, all of them corrupted their ways and their orders. They began to devour each other, and lawlessness increased on the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of men were evil continually. God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, and all flesh had corrupted its orders, and all that were upon the earth had brought all manner of evil before his eyes. And he said that he would destroy man and all flesh upon the face of the earth which he had created. So this is just repeating what we read as an introduction to Genesis 6. But I just want to, we chose this because we wanted to reiterate the idea that the animals themselves had corrupted themselves and their orders. They were being blended together. 
There yeah. was all this this chaos happening because the genetics were being mixed together, and this is where we get the idea of a chimera. Yes, um, that that is that would be why the father would need to destroy all flesh on the earth. That's right. Um, I mean, when you get into the gene splicing and mixing of uh, species, I mean, it's obviously abominable. But then those species reproduce after their kind, who reproduce after their kind, who reproduce after their kind. So you can't stop when you m- when you manipulate genes. Yeah. That has ripple effects all throughout all the rest of those generations. It's not just the you know that one tiger you mix with a you know whatever you mix it with a, a lion <laughs> that's yeah. what everybody likes to talk about these days yeah, the the ligers. Ligers. Yeah. you know then you're gonna have a whole bunch of ligers after that well maybe not the ones we create these days those ones are sterile right yeah <laughs> in what any is, case what is my last my last name is griffin but what is that in mythological chimera terms um, was it an eagle and a lion mixed together that it was some kind of bird yeah it was some kind of yeah. bird mixed with another with a lion yeah, I think you're right. lion claws yeah. and like eagle wings or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So those are called griffins. It's actually my family last name. <laughs> but um, so the, but yeah, that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's the concept is you get these yeah. stories and they're called myths and, you know, fables. But the Bible actually talks about uh, several different chimeras in the well, Bible. Well, not just that, but even when you're in your mythology class in school, they tell you, oh, and back then this wasn't mythology for them. The people taught this is real history. Imagine that. Ha, ha, ha. That's you right. know, like, man, they were some dumb old sheep herders out there. Like, <laughs> all of the ancient societies were speaking this as their true history, and it's only our modern... American. S- our mo- well, even in, main- in modern our Greece. modern secular society, because even you know a lot of the archaeological institutes in Israel itself are very secular. Sure. So you, our modern secular society is all of a sudden all these are just myths and yeah. fables. Up until is us it, now, that wasn't the case. Is it? Um, I saw on a video. I can't remember if it was Rob Skiba. I think it was that he was interviewing a guy from Greece, and he said that growing up in their <clears throat> public schooling, that it wasn't called you know. The Greek myths. Oh yeah, I would imagine was they were taught true Homer. History. Yeah, I would imagine like they, the Greeks yeah. would be taught Homer as history. I mean, not just Homer. Was... I'm talking about all the things we were just talking about. Yeah, about all the fables, the myths, the the the, the gods, and the mixture of creatures right. and everything. They were taught as just true history. That's in modern day times yeah. in this in the country of Greece. That so, makes sense, actually. Yeah, I mean you. <laughs> so uh, in fact, guys, this is actually where um, uh, many people think uh, Javon. Uh, and I, I know that um, Dr. Stephen Pigeon does a really in-depth, you know, genealogical trace of where these tribes became, you know, in the Mediterranean Sea, went up into the England, uh, European areas and everything and in Russia. But I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, but I think it's Javan that became the Greeks. And then the Kaftarim is where we actually, that was what, something we read in Genesis 10. And that was the o- origination of uh, where all the Greek myths and gods came from was the island of Kaftar. That's why in Genesis 10, it was it said that from him came the Kaftarim. Hmm. So that's, anyway. Yeah, it's it's kind of subtly played in there. Again, we'll get to Genesis 10 next year. But um, real quick, we just want to run over Jubilees chapter 6 because um, it has some unique mentions as far as um, just the things pertaining to Noah, what he does when he gets off the boat. Because this is really important, in my opinion, for people to have a broader perspective of him doing stuff that we don't see explained until later. So in Jubilees chapter 6, we're going to read real quick in uh, verses 1 through 5. It says, On the new moon of the third month, he went forth from the ark, and he built an altar on that mountain. He made atonement for the earth, and took a kid and made an atonement by its blood for all the guilt of the earth, for everything that had been on it and had been destroyed, except for those that were in the ark with Noah. And he placed the fat there on the altar. He took an ox and a goat and a sheep and kids and a salt and a turtle dove and a young of a dove and placed a burnt offering on the altar and poured thereon an offering mingled with oil and sprinkled wine and strewed frankincense over everything and caused a goodly savor to arise, acceptable before the Lord. And the Lord smelled the goodly savor, and he made a covenant with him that there should not be any more flood to destroy the earth, that all the days of the earth, seed time and harvest should never cease, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night should not change their order nor cease forever. And you increase, you and multiply upon the earth and become mighty, uh, many upon it and be a blessing upon it. The fear of you and the dread of you I will inspire in everything that is on the earth and in the sea. We already read this in Genesis 9. We understand. But the reason I, I mentioned that is because it actually tells us the ingredients. It gives us the ingredients to what he did when he made an altar sacrifice. Mm-hmm. All these prescribed ingredients, as we see exactly in Leviticus and Numbers, for the priests, Noah was a priest of his family. 
and he's building an, a, an altar of unhewn stone, just like Genesis uh, 12 and 15, where Abraham did, because these guys were priests. They knew God's instructions for how to build an altar and what to use and actually what ingredients to make this meal with. Yeah. And that's what he's doing. Um, so let's also look real quick, because he also says, look, on the new moon of the third month, which I think is interesting. So that's probably for another study. We'll just tease that out there. We'll dangle it like a carrot for later. But <laughs> so, but uh, there's something interesting about uh, the third month and you know the, the supposed new moon on the third month. So many people would, would suspect this was actually Shavuot. So uh, because of the timing involved. So that's fairly interesting. And he's making atonement sacrifice, mm -hmm. which we see happen in Exodus 24 with Moses. Aaron and all the elders on the mountaintop. So anyway, um, real quick, guys, let's go into the same chapter, but it's two verses at the very bottom of 23, um, 20, 23 through 31. All right. So then again, it says, and on the new moon of the first month and on the new moon of the fourth month and on the new moon of the seventh month, on the new moon of the 10th month are the days of remembrance, the days of the seasons and the four divisions of the year. These are written and ordained as a testimony forever. And no ordain them for himself as feasts for the generations forever, so that they have become thereby a memorial unto him. And on the new moon of the first month, he was bidden to make for himself an ark that on the, that on the earth became dry, and he opened the, ar and the ark and saw the earth. And on the new moon of the fourth month, the mouths of the depths of the abyss beneath were closed. And on the new moon of the seventh month, all the mouths of the abysses of the earth were opened, and the waters began to descend into them. And on the new moon of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains were seen, and Noah was glad. And on this account, he, had, he ordained them for himself as feasts for a memorial forever, and thus they are ordained. And they placed them on the heavenly tablets. Each had thirteen weeks from one to another. They are memorial from the first to the second, from the second to the third, and the third to the fourth. And all the days of the commandment will be two and fifty-two days of week, of, excuse me, fifty-two weeks of days. These will make the entire year complete. Thus it is engraved and ordained on the heavenly tablets, and there is no neglecting the commandment for a single year from year to year. What did we just read? This is craziness. So we, what, <laughs> I don't... I, we, we experienced we just, the same thing when I we know. did the study the other night. <laughs> Guys, this here is uh, the first month, the fourth month, the seventh and the tenth month, right? So every three months mm -hmm. throughout the 12-month cycle, he's having a specific <clears throat> festival immemorial to specific events that happened during the flood process. And these are the new moon festivals that are quarterly that he is talking about and having that I think is fascinating because he actually says, as we started in verse 23, on the new moon of the first month, on the new moon of the fourth month. Okay, So he's having these um, once every three months as a memorial saying this happened to me on this month during the flood and then you know in the in the seventh month the, the abysses opened up and the water started going back in you know and that's pretty fascinating um so this was an, an extra memorial that was going on so so many people believe because we have the new moon celebrations that are talked about in numbers 28 so many people believe that that's what's going on here right but I just hope that people understand that there may be a difference here. Well, I think people, I, I don't think people believe that. I think people believe what's happening in Numbers 28 is... That's, yeah, if I festivals. said that backwards, what I'm yeah. trying to say is... Because not a the, lot of people the, are reading yeah. this. What's going on in Numbers 28 is that every month at the first of the month, there was supposed to be a, a sacrifice in a specific moment. Um, but the new moon festivals mm -hmm. were something different. So it wasn't just uh, the first of the month new moon so, uh, commanded sacrifice that right. was to go on. That was kind of a different instruction. This was something that happened every three months all throughout the year, and it was directly tied as a remembrance to the flood itself. So if you decide to keep these as a part of you keeping the commandments of God and, and keeping, because it says, actually, because Noah kept them, it was written on the heavenly tablets so that now Israel keeps them. Mm -hmm. Okay, Because remember, the book of Jubilees is the angels explaining to Moses this is where we get these 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 ideas, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Abraham was the first one to keep the Feast of Booths, so now he, they want all of Israel to keep them because he did it with joy. Noah was the first one to do this, this, and this. This is why I'm explaining to you why we're doing this on this day and this on that day. You see what I'm saying? So this is actually Noah's instruction book for the instructions he was getting uh, for Israel. Okay, and uh, and I would suggest that you know some of these some of the elders of Israel may have heard about some of these, but just didn't have the details. Because remember in Jubilees it says that they actually would forget during the days of being in Egypt and that, that up until 
Mount Sinai moment, they were finally being reminded mm -hmm. of all these things. So um, <clears throat> that's it's just very fascinating. I just want to draw quick attention to that because we see a very controversial passage in the New Testament, which we're going to go into our, our pairings for the New Testament. And, um, and I just think that that's important for people to understand when Paul talks about the new moons. Okay, and, the and that, the next part, we're going to go into where Paul talks about the new moon. It's in Colossians chapter 2. Some of you are already familiar with this verse, but it's uh, Colossians chapter 2 and 16 and 17. All right. So, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Okay. Many people think that it's telling you that you don't have to do these. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that's that's not correct. Paul never told us to stop keeping the commandments of God. Right. In fact, 1 Corinthians 7 he actually tells us all that matters is keeping the commandments of God. Yeah. And in Romans 3.31, he tells us that we do not let our faith negate our actual action. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we actually uphold the law, the instructions of God for living. Right? That's how we exemplify our faith. Yeah. And uh, the Apostle John parrots that in 1 John 2.6, right? But... Um, here, we actually are seeing that these Sabbath days, these feasts, these new moon festivals, these concepts are a what? A shadow of the things to come. So these, as we practice these, they're actually pointing to when the Messiah returns with the new Jerusalem, the kingdom of God. And we're doing these in their full totality. Yeah, you might have been told that this verse means that all these things were pointing just to Christ on the cross. Yeah. Paul is writing this letter after, after Christ cross. was on yeah. the cross. So Paul is very clearly saying that these things are a shadow of the kingdom. They're pointing to the kingdom, which is what Christ himself pointed to. That's right. That's everything that Jesus talked about all the time he walked around was the gospel of the kingdom of yeah. God, the coming kingdom of God. So, yeah, that's that's kind of the mention there. Next thing we're going to run to real quick is Isaiah 66. And uh, this one, I believe, is going to be in verses 22 and 23. Um, we're actually going to look at this <coughs> this new moon concept again. Speaking of the kingdom. <laughs> yeah. This is probably the most appropriate verse to end on, actually. Yeah, Isaiah, he talks about the kingdom of God all the yeah. time. Like, it's just everywhere. All right, so Isaiah 66 in verses 22, 22 and, and 23. 23. For just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, which I make will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. And it shall be from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all mankind will come to bow down before me, says the Lord. All mankind. Mm -hmm. From Sabbath to Sabbath, from new moon to new moon. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Um, you know what's interesting, though, is that... Uh, you know, Enoch defines the new moon as the the sliver of yes. light, right? So after it's dark and then it starts to get light again throughout the course of the month, and it's just that sliver of light. Uh, I can't. I think it's Enoch seventy two. I can't remember off the top of my head, but he remind he tells us that that is the beginning phase. What's considered a new moon, and so many people try to actually find the first of the month or the middle of the month or whatever yeah. by the, the the what they're looking at on the moon and how mm -hmm. the light is upon the moon. But the problem is the moon itself doesn't follow the same. What is it like a 27 day cycle or a 29 day cycle or whatever? 28. Yeah. Is, the moon itself yeah. doesn't follow a 30 day month. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's not going to be the same throughout the time. And we have in Jubilee six, it tells us that the moon itself is off course yeah. because of the uh, rebellious apostasy of mankind on the earth. And so it has caused a, 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 problem with the actual timing where it was supposed to be perfectly timed with the 364 day year so you know just when people start really going full on into this idea of trying to keep a lunar sabbath yeah. that's when you run into a problem because god already gave us a weekly sabbath mm -hmm. every seventh day is the weekly sabbath but there were the first of the month sabbaths what when numbers 28 we mentioned plus these things noah observed as memorials that were called new moon celebrations that he did on a new moon within that within that month the first fourth seventh or tenth month so the point is the since other context within the book tells us that the moon itself is off course mm -hmm. and comes in 10 days too early which i'm assuming from jubilee six means every year which means that's been happening since when yeah who so knows? who knows how to calculate yeah. that now is so the point is that's why it's called rehearsing we're practicing his instructions so that when he, Revelation 21, 1 through 3, he renews the firmament and he brings down the new land. But also in Jubilees 19, 
he actually renews the, the sun, the moon, stars, and the firmament of the heaven. So this whole concept here is that they will be set right. Yeah. They will be fixed. We will be able to tell the appointed be. times by looking at the sky at that point. We're just not there yet because the yeah. Messiah hasn't come back and righted what's been messed up with mm -hmm. that particular order. So it's very interesting. Um, but I just I hope to share that so people can kind of, you know, um, maybe not be so hard on themselves. Yeah. You know, because I've seen a lot of people really go a long way on trying to figure out this lunar Sabbath idea. Not just that, but the whole calendar, the whole trying calendar, to figure out the right just, feast days. And I, I just want to say, hey, read Jubilees, guys. It mm -hmm. tells us we're messed up intentionally, but yeah. in the future, it will be righted again. We're just not there yet. So um, when anyway. he brought them out of Egypt, he reset their calendar. That's so right. even just while they were in Egypt, just for that That's 400 right. odd years, they lost track of, of their calendar. Yeah. So this, and we've been in the dispersion for a long, long time. Yeah, and so the same thing's going to happen when he brings yeah. the kingdom. He's going to reset the calendar for us. Just keep keep the days that you understand to be the right days, yeah. and you know, don't sweat it. Yes, it's not a burden. His yoke is his yoke is easy. That's why he t he calls it discipleship. Now we are learning his ways. We're teaching each other to know the Lord and how to do that by obeying his ways. Uh, but he, the promise of him returning and bringing the kingdom is that we get a resurrected spiritual body that has his ways implanted on our hearts so that we always do them without fail. Yeah. So we're not there yet. We're still learning them. So, you know, on one hand, you're like, look, hey, the, the father's merciful and he's good. Um, this is why we have our high priest, Yeshua, to make atonement for us when we mess up, that, you know, confess your sins and he will cleanse you of all unrighteousness. This is uh, 1 John 1, 9. So I just want to ensure that hopefully as a point of hope and encouragement, we get to see amazing things in Genesis 6 through 10, okay? We get to see the enemy introduced, right? We understand where they came from, which was from the rebellious angels. We saw in Enoch 10 how those rebellious angels were already taken care of, but yet their offspring, are a tenth of them at least, are still the ones that we're dealing with as unclean spirits today, whom in the Gospels Jesus said we have authority over through his name, which is his authority, right? So but when we walk in his commandments, we're therefore in his authority. We can take um, power, if you will, over these unclean spirits to keep them out of our life. But at the same time, we saw Noah keeping God's instructions for living his laws before and after the flood. So because they're eternal, they're, they're being kept in heaven. And when he returns, as that we just read Isaiah 66, we're all going to be doing them and keeping them on the earth. No matter where, whether you're inside of New Jerusalem or outside of it, everyone is going to be learning and doing and keeping the ways of God called his commandments. So we just want to encourage you with that and hopefully uh, shed some light on some of these issues. Because to <laughs> us, Genesis is not boring at all. It no. is power packed. Yeah. It is. There's a lot of content in there and it really excites us. So we hope to share that excitement <laughs> with the viewers, with you guys. Uh, because to me, it's like Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, uh, excuse me, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those books, if, the more you understand those, the whole Bible comes yeah. alive. Just truly does. And it's so much fun to read. So... All right, guys, uh, any last concluding remarks, sweetie? I just, if you made it this far, I just want to thank you as always. Um, I want to remind everyone of what we say on this channel, which is context creates comprehension. We just want to help you guys be able to learn how to read everything in context, keep it in context, and then be able to actually explain that context to everyone in your life, whether they're believers, non-believers, whoever, all creatures. We want you to be able to effectively teach and preach the gospel of the kingdom to all creatures. And in order to do that, you have to keep everything in its proper context. Yeah. But I just want to, you know, welcome. Thank you guys. Browse the playlists. Find us on Facebook, Lindsay and Sean Griffin. And we just really appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us this week. And uh, we hope to see you back here next week on Kingdom Portions.